We're joined this morning by Councillor Gary Donnelly and his colleague Michael Gallagher, who are representatives and community workers in and around Republican areas or communities in Derry City and, and its environs. We're also joined by Brian Doherty and Derek Moore that are pro-union community workers and cultural workers in the Northern Ireland area and even outside of Northern Ireland into Donegal. Uh, as we already explained, we had Gary Donnelly and we had Brian Doherty on separately to discuss issues before, such as the United Ireland, Brexit, the concept of a, of a border down the Irish Sea and the implications and responses of their communities. Well, we have arranged to have both Brian and Gary back on with two of their colleagues to discuss these matters in more detail. We are going to be time limited because there are a lot of questions to get through. So I'm going to get stuck in before looking at all of those politically detailed questions. Can I ask, and this is an open question to everybody, maybe we'll start off with Gary. Um, have any of you had any reluctance or concerns about coming on the show tonight in terms of the response that you might get from your communities? If I could maybe open that up to Gary first. Hello, Thumbar. How's things? Thanks for coming on the show, everybody, by the way. <laughs> No, uh, I, I personally don't have any, any concerns. You know, I, I would know uh, I have been in company of Brian and Derek before. We've had uh, conversations, you know, uh, uncomfortable conversations at times, uh, but at least it's happening. And I think what we need is more of this type of stuff. So no concerns from, from my part. OK, and Brian, how, how are you coming on in terms of your response from your community and... Uh, I mean, personally, again, like uh, Gary was saying, I mean, I, I have no personal concerns. I mean, the dialogue and, and, and building social capital has been something that we as an organisation and me personally have been keen to, to, to do over the last 20 or 30 years. There will be no doubt uh, certain, potentially certain individuals who, who may raise a few eyebrows. But going by the announcement uh, the other day with the, the PSNA, keeping an eye on our social media posts maybe I might have more concerns about them than the, the general public. Right, that, that's quite interesting. Michael, did you have any concerns coming on this morning? No, just echo on uh, what Guy was saying, that no personal concerns, it's just that, that the things like this probably need to happen. People come out of their comfort zones and, and, the, and the such they make any sort of progress. And Derek, any worries? No, I've, no, no, no real worries at all. I think one of the biggest problems that unions have are pro-union people is that they don't speak up themselves enough and they don't uh, they don't make their points um, in open forums um, rather to each other. So I, I really look forward to making a point in open forum. Maybe we're at a, at a point in time that talking is really needed. There's been a lot of news coverage over the last few days about a border poll indicating that the majority of people in Northern Ireland, be it a slim majority at the moment, a majority of people would like a border poll on the question of a united Ireland. Um, what do you think, and I'll, I'll put this over to Brian and to Derek, and maybe Brian first, what do you think your community's reaction to that is? Have you been talking to people are they taking it as a serious move towards a border poll or is it blasé for them? I think it's blasé. I mean, uh, border polls have been coming out on the constitutional issue now for a number of years. I mean, the, the, this recent one by uh, Lucid Talk, which is on the Sunday Times, I mean, it, it covered 2,000, just over 2,000 people. So, I mean, you have to take it to a certain degree with a, a pinch of salt, which is a very small, uh, it's very small coverage. But I mean, if, if you go in, if you delve into the to the figures they're open to interpretation as well. I mean, 51% saying they're in favour of a border poll, but there, I, I would imagine there's a significant number of those from the unionist community who are saying, uh, bring it on. Uh, well, what I would pick up as well is that, you know, that the majority are still not in favour of United Ireland, uh, you know, which is quite astounding. Though those figures have actually uh, stayed quite consistent even in the last four or five years, despite all the the, the media hype and the, the opportunism that came out of the Brexit debate. So, I mean, what I would say is if, if there isn't a, a support, strong support for a, a border poll now, after all the breath bashing of the last three or four years, then when would there be? Okay. And Derek, what's your response? And what reaction did you get, do you think, from your community about this poll? Well, uh well, personally, I take all them polls with a pinch of salt. You know, um, you just have to look at the recent American stuff and all. 
the general election, Theresa May, you know, everything. There's there's a huge, depends what you ask and depends who you ask, I suppose, as Brian uh, sort of mentioned there. I think for me, uh, the huge problem at the minute is that all the, you know, all, all, all the talk and all the drive is really coming uh, from republicanism and, and nationalism. And, and for me, I'm always saying... Uh, they aren't, they aren't, there's not a clear message anyway. Uh, you know, Gary's vision of United Ireland is completely different to uh, Sinn Féin's and stuff like that. So I think that, uh, you know, we need to be getting the message out. And I suppose over the next year, we will be taking the opportunity to put a pro-union point of view uh, on the union and on the benefits of living in Northern Ireland, which is our home for everyone. OK, and we'll give you a platform to do that as well. Uh, Gary, with regards to the poll, what's your reaction to it? What's your community's reaction? Do you think? Well, me, my personal reaction is is could be similar to some of the comments that has just been said there. You know, I, I do take polls with a pinch of salt. And as Derek has pointed out, polls can be they can be wrong. We, we see that we the elections in the US with Trump. We've seen it with the Tories. We've seen it. We we Brexit. But. Having said that, you know, there is, in my view, a, a growing momentum and a push for uh, Irish unity. And, uh, you know, but but there would be Republicans who will push a border poll. However, I would have my own issues with a border poll and I wouldn't be in support of, 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 of a border poll. Uh, whilst Don't I extrapolate do. on that point, that why you wouldn't be in favour? Well, you know... It's a British construct. Uh, we have the the triple lock from Good Friday. Uh, it's it 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 could it legitimise uh, British rule here. You know, if I was a unionist, I, I I would be pushing for a for a for a border poll. You know, it's 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 uh it's not something I as a Republican would 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 be uh would be pushing. I would push for for the uh, and the momentum for a United Ireland. But I don't see a border poll as the mechanism they they achieve that, you know, because it's very there's a lot of ambiguity. What who will write the question? There's even talk now of uh, you know what the majority would need to be. Uh, there's talk about 65 percent uh, turnout and a 60 percent majority. That's that's been muted by Tories regarding I think it's regarding uh, Scottish independence, and we have similar utterances from free state politicians. So, you know, there's a lot of difficulties and a lot of dangers in this for me as a Republican. Okay. Michael, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I work closely with, with Gary, so a lot of what he said would be my sentiments. The only thing I would add to that is that a bit caveat, the, the uh, Republicans are nice who think this is a, a way to United Ireland, that it's not just going to be a binary question. The British are going to control a lot of it. And that uh, basically... I don't think it's just going to be as black and white as as it's going to be painted out there as a roadmap to United Ireland. I don't think it'll achieve that either. Okay, and uh, and this is a question to everybody. And I might start out with Derek, if you don't mind, on this one, Derek. There have been several statements this year from sources claiming to represent loyalist paramilitary factions in and around Belfast. And there are statements have indicated that further moves towards a United Ireland will be met with resistance. And I think the inference was that it could be potentially violent resistance. Uh, what are your thoughts on that statement? Do you, do you think that that's a, a real threat? Or do you think that's just a knee-jerk response to to things like polls and, and Brexit uh, negotiation outcomes? Well, uh, you know, my only thoughts was like I'm totally against any form of violent action at all. Um, I went to a Sinn Féin conference, which uh, Alex Kane was speaking at, and he brought up the same thing. And I think the concept is, uh, why would people in Southern Ireland, uh, you know, uh, vote in favour of any form of United Ireland if there was any form of, say, a one-off Monaghan or Dublin bombing? Um, you know, for me, really, the... Uh, the things 9/11 more or less finished off effective terrorism throughout the world, as far as I'm concerned, and 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 you know technology is now king for state forces in any any country. So I, I don't think there'd be any form of sustained campaign at all. Uh, I don't think that uh, paramilitaries, loyalist paramilitaries, you know maybe have the have the where for all they, they do it. But I do feel that even the threat of it uh, has the potential. They derail any form of uh, any any form of uh, 
border poll or any form of any form of voting. I mean, why why would people in the south why would people in the south want that? Mm. What would your response, Michael, be from as a community worker in Republican areas? What would your response be to those statements from uh, people claiming to be representing loyalist paramilitaries? Well, like loyalist paramilitary violence has always been a factor in, in, in the Six County State throughout its, its uh, assistance. But the, the question has to be, who would they target? Would they be targeting Catholic civilians? Or would they be targeting the people who brought about the situations they're talking about, with the Arch Brexit and uh, the sea borders and all that, which is the British government and the DUP? So my question would be, who would they be targeting? Who would be the target of this violence? Who would they be seeking to, to redress this issue with? Three arms. Okay, a good question. Does Brian or Gary want to come in there with any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, fun bar, I mean uh, there has been I mean, the fluid situation, even in the last couple of days, there's been a growing kind of movement led largely by the Progressive Unionist Party and, and uh, the TUV looking at it. And it's really, uh, well, it's not so much, I suppose, the threat of, of, of loyalist violence, but more of a uh, a kind of disillusionment with how the border down the REC and, and, and the DEP have handled it. So to me, it's not so much a, a kind of return to physical violence, more of a, a, a kind of frustration that there hasn't been proper uh, political leadership within uh, loyalism for, for a number of years. That's something I brought up in the previous interview. You know, what, what people are looking out for within unionism and loyalism is, is proper leadership and an opportunity to get their voice heard. They're not hearing that from the Ulster Unionist Party or the DUP. So to me, it's uh, you know, it, it's about it's more about kind of how does that new form of leadership uh, emerge or 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 reemerge and and you know maybe being cynical and maybe being a wee bit unfair, but I think that there's a wee bit of political opportunism as well coming from the TUV and PUP who see this as an opportunity to, to to be that voice, that alternative voice, which could be pretty much legitimate, but it could also be about. Uh, trying to gain votes from the DUP and Ulster Unionist Party. Would that worry you? No, it wouldn't worry me at all. I, I think we're, we're crying out for, for as many forms of, of effective leadership as we can get, be it through organisations like ourselves, who, who, who've become, a, I suppose, a civic stroke political voice here locally in Londonderry. You know, so the, the more choice uh, the Unionist uh, population have, uh, the better. I mean, I, I wouldn't obviously advocate for any form of, of street violence or or, or, or or physical violence, you know, but I, I mean, I think it's been a myth that's grown up over the last four years, particularly with the Brexit debate, that, that the, the loyalists are, are waiting on the sidelines ready to attack. They've never have and they've never shown any inclination to that. To me, it was uh, opportunism with the, the pro-EU uh, debate, uh, which which proved to, be, proved to be unfounded. And I think a lot of it may as well be still be coming from that uh, media narrative. You mean now that the the hard border down uh, the island hasn't happened because of Brexit? People are looking, I think, for another excuse to to goad almost the the unionist community. Okay, uh, Gary, do you want to come in there with anything? Yeah, look, I wouldn't be no expert on on you know or best place to establish the veracity of of these type of uh, statements, but you know I think that. There is loyalist violence. It does exist. Particularly, there's been a number of attacks in the northwest. You know, uh, shooting and 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 pipe bomb attacks. But I think you know, I think Mickey hit the button there when he says, you know, who who would be the target here? Who who is the? In my view, the biggest threat to unionism, and I've said this before, is the the Tory government. Do you know what I mean? It's that hard Brexit, uh, middle England. And, uh, you know, there's, there's absolutely no strategy in, in, in loyalist paramilitaries attacking innocent Catholics. And I think a lot a lot of this will, will come down to who's actually sponsoring them. You know, I think there's no doubt in my, my opinion is that in the past, uh, loyalist paramilitaries have been created, armed, financed and uh, supplied with intelligence, almost sponsored by, by the British state. You know, that will be a factor. <coughs> that isn't there then it 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 uh you know it's a different ball game but i do think that there will be a strong pushback from unionism in respect of any formal moves towards uh united united ireland but i think the idea of violence is used is pushed by the establishments in order to promote their agendas too that's an interesting point 
Derek, uh, no, not Derek, it was Brian, I think, mentioned this border down the Irish Sea uh, as a result of the outcome of Brexit negotiations. In your opinion, is that what the outcome has been, the border down the Irish Sea? And what is the response from the community, people you've been talking to? And we'll move on to Derek after that, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, well, sorry, do you want myself or Derek? Yeah, Brian, please? if you can first. Yeah, please. I mean, it's, it's semantics to me. I mean, I, I, mean, I, I don't... Uh, I, I didn't wake up on first of January and think that oh no, I'm I'm, I'm disconnected from the uh, from the mainland. I mean, it, it, it's it, it's it's unfortunate, you know. And I think you know, but I, I think a lot of it has been, uh, you know, around that kind of lack of uh, kind of trust and, and and honesty between the the, the British government and, and the DUP here locally. I mean, there's no doubt that the DUP made a mess of it, and and at some point need to. Put their hands up and and uh, kind of recognise that. But to, to me, I think uh, a lot of it will be resolved. You know, there's opportunities. I think within Brexit, and, and it was uh, encouraging to see some of the captains of industry coming out last week, like Nissan and Sunderland. Uh, you know, declaring that the, the the Brexit the Brexit won't affect the jobs, despite that being you know a core point of the argument prior to. To, 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 to us leaving, there's opportunities within the city alone with foil port potentially becoming a free port. There's enterprise zone opportunities. There, there, there's stuff, that, there's doors that open and that the EU slammed shut uh, previously. I mean, we, we used the example of, of Shannon Airport in the south, which was kind of considered a free port, and, and, and a number of jobs around that area were lost uh, because of the EU, EU restrictions and regulations. So to me, it isn't all, it, it shouldn't all be uh, declared. Uh, negative, and then what we got to understand as well is the the EU have to take some uh, responsibility for this because a lot of the the delays at the moment uh, and the scaremongering around shortages and and, and and supermarkets, which is a nonsense, you know, has come has, been, has come from the huge amount of red tape and bureaucracy that the EU are implying, which they always impl- imply on 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 everything, be it from SEUPB funds right through to how they operate their how they've operated their uh, business, you know, for the last twenty or thirty years, so they're they're obsessed with with bureaucracy, and it's inefficient, and it's ineffective, and it's dictatorial. You know, so uh, the argument needs needs to go back to to asking what the EU uh, responsibility or what their influence is, and all this. And you see the current arguments going on now about the vaccine and how they've completely uh, the EU have completely messed up the rollout of the vaccine across the EU uh, countries. So it's not just Britain's fault. We've got to get away from this. Uh, Brit, Brit bashing and look at who look who else is to to, to blame and who else can uh, actually help resolve some of the the teething problems that we have. I think probably if we were honest with ourselves and tried to be neutral and looked at the Brexit negotiations, we could see to use a a common phrase. There's numpties on both sides in, in both Dublin and London. I think. Uh, would you like Derek to add anything to Brian's? response to the question about a, a border down the Irish Sea. In your mind, is there a border down the Irish Sea? What's your and your community's response? Well, I suppose, uh, you know, it's quite a mess at the moment. Uh, um, I didn't didn't vote for Brexit myself, uh, and I'll take some convincing that it's going to be the best. But you never know. In the long run, it could be. I think most people uh, basically just get on with things because th- those things are way beyond our control. Um, and, and I don't think that... Uh, that we're going to make very much difference. I've always said all along that, as far as I'm concerned, uh, money talks and money will make it work in the end up. Uh, as for the community, I suppose there are people again, but as a scaremonger and you know, my own wife saying about stuff not being on shelves and stuff like that. But uh, you know, that, I, I'm sure that'll resolve itself. Okay, Gary and Michael, maybe start off with Michael. There well, appears to be a, there appears to be a border down the Irish Sea. Is that not enough for Republicans? No, I don't think it is. I think I echo what Brian and, and Derek said that that, that uh, the ramifications will be long term. The short term ramifications just seem to be a nuisance for lorry drivers. As regards Republican objectives, it's far, far, it's nowhere near. Like the PSNI is still uh, the police force who's plying their wares around the streets of Cregan here, uh, harassing and intimidating people. Uh, the rut of Boris Johnson and, and, and the Westminster government still rule large over the six counties. I mean, no, no one here, Derek, Brian, Gary, or myself, have or can or will be able to cast a vote for Rishi Sunak, for Pili Patel, or for Boris Johnson. We ultimately dictate what happens in the six counties. So that's still there. There's still social and economic deprivation. 
and uh, the politics in the six counties is still as backward as ever. So, no, it's so much the same that the, the, the economic border down the ABC, whatever the ramifications in the future, we do not know. But in the short term, no, it has no uh, bearing on on the current situation. The status quo is very much in place. Okay, Gary, do you want to add that, anything to that? Yeah, I suppose that you know, echo what what Michael said. The British, you know, the apparatus is all still exists, and I'm just not. I'm not sure that a simple national demarcation of a border between Ireland and Britain will satisfy you know millions of of, of Irish people seeking genuine uh, reunification. And you know, I think we need to get away from that shallow thinking that just by denying one section of the inhabitants of this state you know, what they believe is their appropriate constitutional, legal or economic uh, entitlement or even association with Britain, that the rest of the population that we are happy or should be happy, you know, my identity, my Irish identity is in no way validated by sort of invalidating the identity of anyone else. And when I'm, and I'm talking about the unionist community when I'm saying that, you know, and neither does it please, you know, it, it, it doesn't, I don't take any sense of satisfaction by seeing anyone sort of disconnected from from their own identity. I think that Irish self-determination, you know, it will and it should continue beyond simply the implementation of the so-called Irish protocol. I think it's a lot deeper than that, you know, even in the, in, in the effect of a, of a united Ireland, you know, as, as it's been said you know, it's not a, a matter of removing one flag and replacing it with another. We need, you know, we need proper, uh, we need, we need uh, to be looking after all the citizens of the country. So, no, definitely not. It doesn't, I don't take any pleasure in that. Okay. And um, is there a triumphalism and a certain bravado developing in the nationalist community in relation to you know, the moves, what appears to be moves towards a united Ireland and things like that. Is there any concerns that there's a, a triumphalism about that? Uh, can I pass that on to maybe uh, maybe Derek first and, and get Derek's idea? Is there any worries or is there any... Have you have you noted yourself that there seems to be this uh, almost moving towards victory after hundreds of years uh, kind of a, an attitude? Well, I think as, as uh, Brian alluded to earlier, you know, there has been the last four years of sort of really like Brit, Brit bashing and uh, et cetera. And, and as I've alluded to earlier, uh, one of the big problems is we haven't uh, stood out as, as pro-union people and, and made an argument against that. So I think it's easy to understand the thinking. You know, the Republicans have had 100 years of folk stories about the great reuniting. You know, even though the Northern Republicans were abandoned in the first place, similar to the Southern Unionists. So... And the other big problem for me is, and, and you know, we've had discussions on it before, I think Northern Republicans and a lot of people who live in the North don't realise how addicted they are to a British way of life. Um, you know, uh, we live in a society, uh, you know, that basically is fairly free for all of us. Your thinking is allowed, whatever whatever you wish to be, Irish, British or whatever, uh, and, and that entitlement is there. I, th- I think in the main... A lot of people are really more interested in getting on with their own lives, you know, like feeding their ch- feeding their children, educating their children, uh, and knowing that when you're sick, you can go to a free health service. No, there's a lot of unknowns in a in a United Ireland, uh, and I think that you know sometimes some Republicans are deluding themselves by thinking that uh, uh, that it's going to happen easily. I, I I look on it as a sort of Moses project. You know, a lot of them can see the United Ireland, but Moses never got there either. Okay. Would uh, Brian like to come in on that? Have you sensed the triumphalism, uh, bravado? Uh... Not uh, within the, the, the local community. You know, uh, it has come where it's, where it's come from, and you know, without sounding like a broken record, I mean, it's really coming from people who who, who don't live in, in, in working class nationalist or Republican communities or. Or, uh, or or work there. It's, it's it's really been coming from I suppose the mainstream political parties, particularly Sinn well, particularly Sinn Fein and the SDLP, but also academia and, and the media. I mean, I, I'm not too uh, sure how much of the triumphalism is real. I mean, if you if you listen to Michael and and uh, and, and Gary here as well. I mean, who, who do you work in in, in in those communities? They're a lot more measured and they're approaching a, a lot more realistic. And a, a lot more honest about it. So I mean, I, I, I'm. I mean, to me, as I say, it's coming from academia. It's coming from mainstream media, and also some 
uh, kind of spin doctors and 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 ego maniacs and, and and social media as well. Okay, Gary, do you want to come in there at all? Do yeah. you have a sense of a coming victory? Do you think that a triumphalism is a healthy healthy thing at this time or? Definitely not. Look, I, there's there's no doubt that we live in a society here that people, that a lot of people, some people in a way, subscribe to that if unionism, if it's bad for unionism, it's good for nationalism or republicanism. Uh, you know, and, and when you just look at social media and you see, you know, and there's been two events here sort of locally, and when you read the comments on social media, you know, one was the death of a local man here, a local Republican, and, you know, when it's when it goes on to the media, you know, the, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, triumphalism and, and, and really sort of sectarianism. You know, the other one would be the release of, 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 of Michael Stone, you know. So there's no doubt that, that that exists. And what doesn't help also is that, you know, when you see politicians, there was a recent parade in, in, in Sturban within the last few years. And when you see, uh, you know, a, a prominent nationalist politician dancing up the street with a tricolour around her shoulder, like some green version of Orange Lull. That that type of stuff is not, uh, you know, it's not helpful. But I think we would be naive to think that in some corners, you know, that there wouldn't be at the very least sort of quiet satisfaction of the way that things have turned out after Brexit, you know, because by and large, a lot of nationalists campaigned against it. I, I, I wasn't one of them. And, you know, many unionists voted in support of it. And in getting that sort of Brexit, you know, the unionism sort of enacted, and in, in, in my view, a lot of damage to the union when, in fact, they thought that they were taking steps to sort of solid, you know, solidify their future within it. You know, having said that, I would advocate that we need a more sensitive and diplomatic approach devoid of, of triumphalism, you know, because it's not my, personally, it's not my style. And I believe that, you know, when we're talking about unification and integration of everyone on the island, you know, I think it needs to be done in a sort of socially just and in, in inclusive way. And it's about bettering the lives of, of everyone who lives on this island, you know, and that includes working class communities who have probably, you know, no doubt have suffered uh, most. Uh, and that, to me, as a Republican, that's the, as a result of the outworking of clon colonialism and imperialism and the conflict which evolved from that. Okay. I was going to ask Brian and Derek, but I don't know if you've already answered it just now. I was going to ask you if you or your communities had any specific worries about what, what would your objections be to, uh, other than the historical aspects of things, what would your objections to a United Ireland be? Would there be any fears or concerns? You know, when you look back at our history, we were all brought up to believe that whenever major historical events happened in terms of Ireland and Britain, that there'd be massacres, that there'd be all of these horrible, horrible events to occur, uh, and that that's been cycled over centuries at this stage. Are there any concerns in modern times that your communities would be oppressed or suppressed? Mm -hmm if there was a uh, united ireland in any way is that one of the concerns yeah uh i mean it's not uh i mean i, I think we, we, all, we all try to be pragmatic and uh realistic and honest about it you know and i know we, we shouldn't go back into history but what has re-emerged you know particularly with the anniversary this year in 2021 uh there's been a lot of uh commentary particularly from southern uh, sources, you know, referring back to the to the impact of the civil war and the Protestant community in their own Cork, for example, and the uh, the ethnic cleansing of of the, the the Protestant population. I mean, that continued right through the century. And and when you look at figures of of the the Protestant community in Donegal uh, now, you compare it to what they were then. But I mean, I I, I don't. I don't honestly believe that if there was United Ireland tomorrow, that 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 type of uh, you know, genocide would happen again. But I mean, there are the, the concerns I would have really are around, you know, uh, the basic human rights around equality and, and recognition of of, of, of of my culture. Uh, I, I, I've been a community worker here for 30 years in, in Derry, and, and we've been a minority community here for 30 years. And, and I've spent those 30 years doing, uh, you know, fighting for uh, the rights of, of the unionist population, the loyalist population. 
in the city here. You know, so I, I would see how Derry Straban District Council have, have, have treated unionists in the city, probably as a microcosm of how they may be treated in the United Ireland. You know, uh, you, you look at how Dublin has treated uh, Donegal, for example. You know, so all, all, all those economic impacts and, and that strive for equality will, will come to the fore. There's also huge issues. You know, I mean, no one is going to vote for United Ireland based on the slogan on the side of a bus the way that we Brexit, nor are they going to uh, vote for United Ireland based on uh, a couple of bullet points on posters that Sinn Féin had up before Christmas. People, the, the, one of the benefits of Brexit has been that no one ever again is going to have the wool pulled over their eyes and go into a major decision without really going through the minutia of, of, of the impact. And to me, as a, as a, a Protestant and in Ireland, the questions I'd be asking is, well, what happens to my beloved Northern Ireland football team? I mean, you wouldn't ask a Liverpool fan to merge with Everton or, or Man City to merge with Man United, and that's a real practical issue. What happens to the national anthem? What happens to the flag? What happens to the uh, expression of cultural identity? Will Orange Order uh, be able to march and parade in, 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 in Dublin? So if you take away all the the huge economic arguments and, and benefits. There's the social benefit, the social impact uh, that all needs to be worked out. And, and at the moment, because goes back a wee bit to, to the issue around the, the time for a border poll. Do, do we really, after coming out of Brexit, you know, being in the middle of COVID, are we is energy really there within the community to go through all those uh, discussions at this stage? Okay, I think this leads on to well to our next question. I won't put that out to anybody else because there's a lead that was kind of leading to a, a following question. Uh, Gary, last year you put a motion to the floor in Derry City Council to not commemorate in any way the uh, 100 years of partition of the North and the South of Ireland. Uh, at the time, Sinn Féin and the SDLP supported that motion and we spoke to Brian about that, and Brian had said at uh, at the time that he expected it from yourself, but he was pretty surprised and shocked by the SDLP and Sinn Féin, who were always talking about uh, acknowledging and recognising other people's uh, traditions, etc., and that they went on a little bit of a triumphalist uh, uh, rant in relation to this. Um, are there any circumstances, Gary, in which you would, if not materially support yourself, that you would not object to the commemoration of 100 years of partition or something like that. So, for instance, let's say there was a United Ireland and at some stage that historical event was proposed to commemorate that event in a United Ireland. Would you object to that event then? I'm just trying to find out where the boundaries are here. Well, look, you were talking about that, about the SDLP and Sinn Féin. It's my opinion that that you know, we're in a different place now that we were a month ago regarding my motion because it has been rescinded. And I view that, you know, as 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 pandering the 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 unionism. Uh you know, it's fundamental for me and you know, partition and we don't have to rehearse the arguments what partition has done to this island and to the people on this island and, and including the people in, 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 in Britain. The reality is is that partition exists and all that flows from partition is very alive and well, and we're living that out on a daily basis here. But in the context of an overall settlement, uh, the absence of conflict, the absence of, uh, you know, sovereignty, you know, the, the conflict over sovereignty, by all means, unionist community and their culture and that needs to be, you know, protected and they need to be able to exercise that right. You know, in a, in a, in a non triumphant way, not not and and where it's welcome, you know. And I think when we look at Ross Nola and Donegal, I think you know that's a model that uh, where it passes off very peacefully. It's a family oriented day out, and nobody bats an eyelid, you know. So I think what well, the problems that we have at the minute is is that uh, you know imperialism and. Uh, Interference is very much alive and well, and that will taint any type of, of uh, you know, taint, it taints all situations that we're faced with. Yeah. So let me be clear on what you're saying here. In the circumstances in which there was a united independent Ireland, you would be a lot more open to 
commemorating historical facts and events? Uh, well, look, my, as a Republican, that's, that's, that's a basic tenet of my Republicanism. You know, it's in, it's in our flag. It's in our, it's in our, uh, in our proclamation. It's in, you know, it's in all our documents. And, you know, it, we have to practice what we preach. That's, that, that is it. Michael, would your thoughts be in the same vein as Gary's? Yes, uh, I would. I, I think that uh, this notion that it's orange versus green is a uh, anathema to republicanism. Republicanism is about a polit- political project. They give the people of Ireland their national self determination. They have control over their own destinies. And in the event of that that happened, that I think the republicans would have to go that extra mile to accommodate the uh, unionists because of the historical circumstances that uh, we find ourselves in. And as Gary said, we have to practice what we preach and accommodate. And um, make this as uh, comfortable a society for unions as, as possible, be that political power, be that uh, cultural uh, events and, 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 and the such. And Republicans would have to, to demonstrate to that section of our population that uh, they're welcome in a new and a, a agreed Ireland. When does that start in the, from the point of view of, like, if I, I am going to ask Brian and Derek now, they are words. How reassuring are those words? Um, I know that both parties here tonight have been working together, uh, sharing community services, uh, talking to each other for a few years now. But does comments like that reassure you, Derek and Brian, in terms of those kind of concerns that you'd have about your culture being being suppressed? Well, uh, I mean, uh, I I am a bandsman, uh, you know, so I'm I, I'm in a band, very and very proud of it. And and I'd have to say, Finbar, the only place that the suppression of culture happens uh, is in Northern Ireland. Um, you know, we're very comfortable going to going to Limerick International uh, Marching Bands Festival in Limerick and stuff. We have ten thousand people with tricolours on the streets shouting, you know, play the sash, play the sash. You know, you can back up to our own city. Uh, in times in the past, there have been twenty or thirty people. Uh, standing at the diamond, maybe Gary and that was among them, you know, saying uh, this is a, you know, triumphalism and stuff. So I think, um, you know, people's perceptions are slightly different. Uh, as far as we're concerned, it's, it's completely cultural. I'm not saying that it's all perfect or there's not instances where there is uh, bad behaviour. But I mean, organisations like ourselves who have worked in the city here through the Maiden City of Cordino, which is a, a protocol on, on, uh, on, on parading and stuff like that. But it's it's basically uh, it's it's a roadmap for everyone to look at and for everyone to try and enjoy it. As I say, we we have real really no problem in Southern Ireland uh, portraying our culture. We had a band in uh, you know last year uh, down in Sligo at the Fla and stuff like that there. So I mean, all all the issues around uh, you know suppression of culture have come from Northern, and even some of the stuff that has happened in Southern Ireland was Northern people down watching it. And given off about uh, Protestants actually being in the Republic of Ireland, so uh, the Good Friday Agreement actually would give us a lot of control uh, around culture stuff uh, in 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 uh, you know the unlikely scenario that United United Ireland would ever come about. But um, you know there's 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 a lot of things that that we we could uh, we, we could work on there. Okay, and Brian, and I'll jump over to the next question, uh, but only because we're getting tight for time at this stage and there's a good few questions to go through yet. Um, are there any circumstances in which you, and do you think maybe members of your community, would accept a severance from London connections and controls in terms of, of uh, authority and having the independence, Northern Ireland having the independence to make all decisions? So a separate Northern Ireland in some way, whether it's in a united Ireland or not. Are there any circumstances in which you would support that type of severance? For instance, if there, and let's be really imaginative, if there was a tyranny took over in London and it, it created an authoritarian regime that would seemed impossible to move, even at that stage, would you consider a severance? I'm just trying to establish borders and boundaries here. What do you mean when a tyranny takes over in London? I think it's already happened. But you know, the, I mean, uh, to me, uh, I mean, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't get on a boat and and sail to Scotland like Arlene or, or move to Florida like Peter Robinson. You know, I, I'd still stay here and 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 my country. But to me, an independent Ulster, you know, and I know there was, I mean, Glenny Barr was a big advocate of that in the past. But to me, it's a bit like 
again, going back using a, a sport analogy, it, it's like going back to a football match and drawing one each and coming off the field. No one's really happy. So I, I don't know why it, it would be seen as a, as a, you know, kind of morally as a as a win or, 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 or a satisfactory uh, position. Economically, it would be a, a complete non-starter. I mean, I think the reason why the Scottish referendum will ultimately fail will be, will be because the economics don't add up. Uh, in Scotland, and you know, whenever the last referendum happened in Scotland, the analysis showed that it was the, actually the Mullers who who, who, got, who uh, voted to, to to stay because they were able to detach themselves from the the kind of romantic uh, idealism of, of of Braveheart to, to to look at how it might impact on their their children and their grandchildren. You know, so they, they were a lot more pragmatic and realistic. And okay, and, well, and but, instead, Scotland can't, can't, can't uh, uh, maintain itself. Uh, economically, what chance does uh, a population of 1.6 million with a, a very low manufacturing to yourself? To, to, okay, to... We'll, we'll, we'll step back and instead of just looking at uh, a sovereign Northern Ireland, mm. any form of severance from London, I think that's the point I'm really trying to get to, that no matter what London does into the future, will there be any circumstances in which you'll say we need to get away from London, whether it's to join get into the EU, whether it's to join the United Ireland or be sovereign. Is there any circumstances you think where you would advocate for a severance from London? Personally, I, 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 I don't. I mean, uh, despite how they've handled Brexit and, and what's happened recently, I still think they're the best case scenario. I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge safety net. You know, they've been the seventh largest economy in the world compared to the 31st and, uh, and, and starts 34th. In the South, uh, I mean, uh, I know, I know it, it may be a part of the shared Ireland discussion going forward, and, and people talked about it uh, in the United Ireland, there's still been a devolved government in Belfast. To me, uh, that's, you know, it's just a, a different flip of the same coin from from uh, from London. In fact, it would probably feel less secure given our, our peripherality geographically from, from, from Dublin, you know, and, and again, going back to, to how it's impacted and, and the... The, the economy in, in Donegal, I, I would have huge concerns there. I mean, listen, I, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd vote against it, I'd, I'd argue against it, but I, I wouldn't pick up arms if, if, if it happened, you know. But to me, I, I just don't think, I think it's probably the least best case scenario of, 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 of where we're at at the moment. Okay, Derek, would you like to add anything to that? Um, well, I would just say, I think one of Gary's earlier points is probably fairly valid. That we, we do we do have to worry about uh, English nationalism um, and, and, and Northern Ireland and, and an England first approach. I think as, as someone from Northern Ireland, I feel, uh, you know, I feel closer to Welsh and, and Scottish people, maybe because I'm a rugby player. But, um, you know, so the, the, the English question is always going to be there. Um, for me, it, it, it It'll, it'll boil down basically the, the the financial stuff and all you know, and I've had the discussion before, uh, you know, maybe with with Gary uh, and Michael, you know, a, a United Ireland based on the based on the promise of Britain paying for it for the next fifty years, uh, you know, must be an anathema to Republicans. I mean, what what kind of United Ireland is that there, uh, and who would trust Britain, uh, you know, once it's signed over to pay for anything, and how would that leave how would that leave Northern Republicanism? Uh, you know, with, with southern, uh, with southern Irish people, if they if they bring something on them that that ultimately uh, causes their economy and stuff major problems. Okay, it sounds to me uh, that although none of you would ever advocate for a separation, if there was a separation that was economically viable, and that maintained, uh, if not improved, people's standard of living, that it's not something that you would physically. Uh, uh, resist anyway, I think is, is, is what, what you're saying there. Um, Gary and Michael, I'm going to invert that question over to yourselves. Is there a, if, if Britain tomorrow became, and you both guys proclaim to be Republican socialists, if Britain tomorrow became a socialist utopia, if everybody was so happy, so wealthy, had lots of time to themselves, if everything was just hunky dory because of some changes with the London uh, Northern Irish relationship in which you, they, they remained connected, would you accept that? Socialist Republican and give up your uh, socialist um, utopia and give up your Republican ideals for United Ireland. Or is there anything that would change your mind? Uh, look, 
it's very very hypothetical it hasn't happened and and it's it my view it's not going to happen but you know if it did happen it would still be subverting the sovereignty of the island you know there's people in Donegal and Dublin and Cork and Kerry and it would still be subverting that and 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 people in the six counties look I, I'm Irish my identity is Irish and I want to you know I want to live and reside in Ireland you know when you talk about uh, being tyrannical the free state you know it's not far in my opinion it's not far of it it's uh there's a lot of corruption uh the 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 past influence of 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 the church and that you know so it, what i would do was that uh, you know i would i would keep campaigning as a republican for an all ireland uh socialist republic and i wouldn't abandon it just you know that that ideal because uh of you know of my own of uh, ex- expectations uh because that's 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 my goal and and i think unification would be the the first step as i said the the corruption discrimination elitism and 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 the 26 counties that needs challenged just as much as it needs challenged in 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 the six counties okay michael do you want to add anything to that no basically i would like what brian was saying i wouldn't get in the boat and sail away because uh i don't like the the nature of, of uh, the regime in Ireland. I would adopt the position probably that that uh, people did in Italy when it was a fascist regime, people did in Germany when it was a fascist regime, people the French French stood against the German occupation and uh, and to be honest with you, like we don't have to look too far back in the past to see about the rise of the blue shirts and the attitude adopted to that sort based somewhere along us along the lines that is to say it's hyper very hypothetical. Okay. And if Britain was a utopian socialist state, I have no doubt they would be a, 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 a support for uh, defeating fascist regimes and such. Okay. Um, second last question, guys. And it gets to the nub, I suppose, of how we think and why we think and what we believe. How much, and this is out to everybody, how much of your commitment to either pro, the pro-union position or the United Ireland Independent Republican position, how much of that is based on emotions and historical connections and how much is it based on practical thinking and application? So thinking the process out and, and that it would be more favourable for your communities to be in one or the other. How much of it is about emotions and history and how much is it about practical considerations? Maybe Brian first. Can I throw that out to you, Brian? Yeah, it's a tough one. Yeah, uh, that's that's probably a bit of both. I mean, you, you you can't deny your identity and 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 what you were born into and what you what you grew into. I mean, I I've been apologising for being British for the last thirty years. It's been shoved in the face and it's been you've been physically attacked, verbally attacked because because of that identity. So uh, and actually that would uh, that, that that gets your back up and 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 you you become more determined to to, to retain. Your, your your sense of identity. I mean, if you go to any country in the world, you know, America is an example, or even in the South. I mean, there's just nothing wrong. You shouldn't be apologising for for where you're from and 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 where your home is and 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 and, and what you believe in. It's it, it's it's how you're brought up. And I was brought up in a in a, in a Protestant cultural identity. I was brought up supporting certain uh, sporting clubs and you know supporting on Ireland football team, but also support the. Uh, international rugby team and I'm a member of the Irish cricket board which is an Ireland team and I, I, I'd support that and protect that and stand up for that as, as, as much as as, as as anyone and we have uh, we have had that thrown in our face from an Irish, from a cricket perspective as well about not having our own or having a, an all-Ireland team so to me it's, it's simply about it's, it's about being, it's about being proud, proud in your and in, in your identity and it's not about colonialism and, and, and that's about sovereignty and it's about you know a, a pride a sense of nationalism and to me that that, that would that's what would hurt most, and that's what I want to protect most. I don't. I don't want people telling me I should be something else or or or, or, or doing something else. Obviously, the, the practical arguments stand over themselves. I mean, I could stand here and list off ten economic reasons why we we're, we're better in the UK, but I mean, everyone's heard them before, you know. But so to me, it's 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 it's, it's both, you know. And, and uh, I I would have huge concerns. I know Derek says that we, you know, we're well received in the south, and it's a much more diverse country and. And, and and welcome and com- country I think than here in in Northern Ireland, but I mean I, I would still I would still have concerns. But as I said earlier on, uh, you know we although 
where we're pro-union, well, we, we've effectively, in, in Derry here, we've effectively been in it. You know, the, the whole mentality of a national city here has had has had that pro-Irish kind of identity. So we, we, we have been fighting to stand up for our rights here now for, for 30 years. And, and my concern would be, you know, if, uh, you know, is Derry and, and how Derry treats its, its Protestants a microcosm of what it's going to be like in, in the United Ireland. Am I going to have to spend the rest of my life in the United Ireland fighting for, for my cultural light, rights and identity and, and not have to hide it under a, a, a bushel or, or, or be denied it or, or have to apologise for it? That's, and I wouldn't be prepared to, to do that. Okay. okay. So it's not just the practical things. You're, you're, you just can't ignore your historical, your cultural upbringing and how that impacts our emotions as well. Uh, Derek, do you want to add to that? I'm going to bring Gary and Michael in on the very same question then. Uh, I think I think Brian's covered it very well there, Fumbar. Uh, I mean, for myself, you know, I suppose I really consider myself to be Northern Irish, uh, you know, and, and in a historical sense and in a cultural sense, because you know, I, I feel a responsibility to carry on the culture that I, that I've been brought up in, the bands, the music, uh, the dance, the drama, and stuff like that. There, uh, I think Brian makes a really good point uh, about how we live locally, and a discussion we've had with uh, Gary and his colleagues and others uh, as well. Uh, you know, it's not, uh, you know, it's it's not, it's not how they do it. It, you know, it's, it's how, how they think and how they say it. And the, this past few months has been very uncomfortable in the city. Um, and it, and it, if it is a microcosm of a, of a of, of the state of, of a United Ireland, then it's not a very comfortable state. So I suppose Brian has covered all them points, uh, you know, very, very well. OK, thanks for that, Derek. Uh, Gary and Michael, we'll start off with Gary. Yeah, the same- there's no doubt from Bar that there is historical and traditional, you know, concerns and they evoke emotions and a sense of sort of, you know, denied belonging. And 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 we've all lived that out, you know, uh, collective and traditional memory of, you know, of, of inequality, discrimination, countless atrocities. And, and you know, and this is not just in the historical sense, this is, you know, actual things that you have, have witnessed, you know, and that's been throughout the span of, of, of British intervention in Ireland. You know, and there's no doubt that that's, that has had a strong emotional impact on my position. But having said that, you know, we can't deny we can't deny the practicalities of modern life and the current situation that we find ourselves. And you know, uh, my opinion, the constituents that I represent will be better serviced and provided through the unification of the the island. And there's a strong, you know, despite what Derek and and Brian has said, there's a strong social, cultural, and economic argument. Uh, for unification, and you know, and, and, and places like Craigan have very seen very little change in the last fifty or sixty years. There's less jobs now than there was, you know. Then educational attainment is very poor. You know, youth unemployment, economic uh, inactivity, uh, it's it's generally very very high. Uh, there's health inequalities which are very apparent, and you know, and that's been. Uh, as a result of exclusion and underinvestment, underinvestment, uh, neglected working class communities like 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 Craigan exist across a political divide, uh, and I, I believe it's it's these communities which will see you know the the, the greatest benefits of, of 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 unification. And and I just want to make one point, which is you know when 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 unionist colleagues here say about it's been a difficult time here for unionists, it's a difficult time in this city for Republicans or nationalists who don't subscribe to the mainstream political party position. And, you know, even last night in, in, in the council, uh, workers are entitled to wear the poppy, but Councillor Paul Gallagher has a, has a motion, which is five years in the process of allowing workers to wear the Easter lily. And effectively, that had been blocked again by, by unionists, and the SDLP were led by the nose to support that. You know, and and unionism is in a, a minority in the city. So you know, it's not just a one way street here. There's a lot of uh, inequalities right across the the divide. It would sound like that there does seem on both sides to be areas that need further, certainly further explanation about acknowledging and respecting cultural differences and similarities, because there's a lot of cultural similarities too. Michael, do you want to come in there with anything? Well, uh, I think that you can't ignore history and, 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 and the such, but the difference between being a nationalist and a Republican, a Republican has a, a, a political viewpoint, which uh, sees a political direction, 
but this country would be far better off uh, without the control of uh, the mandarins and white call and, and, and the, the people in this elect and have more control of our own destinies, be it me, Guy, Derek, or Brian. And that's the difference between being a Republican. That is, it's, a, it's a political viewpoint you come to rather than be born under. And that's the only difference I would see. Of, of course, that the historical backdrop, the, what happened in Ireland is complex and it's deep and, and all that. But sometimes that gets it away in the clarity of our message. And I think that's one of the, the problems that we have as Republicans. They try and decipher all that and take all that away from it and say, look, we believe we're better off uh, making our own decisions rather than the Boris or Tony Blair, whoever maybe. Okay. We're coming up on the hour now, guys, so we're going to have to cut off very soon. One last question. I'm not going to make anybody answer this question. If anybody, uh, Brian, you have commented on it already in relation to an independent sovereign state of the north of Ireland in some way that can have its own agreements with both London and Dublin. Does anybody else have any comment for you on that? Is that, is, is that just not a card that's going on the table for anybody? It doesn't look at in my view, you know, the we have tried all this type of stuff and, and it doesn't work. Even power sharing in the six counties doesn't work. You know, you know, not with it. We look at the what's going on at, at, at the minute. Uh, everything that's been tried in the six counties has failed miserably. And I think, you know, I think we need to brave it and, 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 and call it a day. And as Mickey just outlined, you know, it's up, it's, it's up for the people on this island to... The, the, you know, for self determination without any type of uh, outside interference. Derek, an independent sovereign Northern Ireland of some sort. What do you think? Well, I mean, I really, uh, I can't imagine anything more absurd. You know, uh, if you look at our current politicians running anything more in their own egos. Uh, uh, you know, which, and and even that's too complicated for them. You know, uh, we have politicians that the, you know, require uh, our politics requires no minimum standard to get into. Uh, I kind of, you know. Uh, I refute Gary and, and Michael's points there a, a, a wee bit, you know, uh, you know, because the people are not going to run the country anyway, uh, whether it's Mandarins in Whitehall or whatever, or Mandarins in Dublin and, and Brussels. It, it really makes it really makes no difference. We, we are only working class people. And, and, and you know, we, we are going to be judged by that. And, and it's going to be going to be run by that. But uh, I, I, I th there's definitely no place for an independent uh, Northern Ireland. Because I struggle to see an an, uh, an independent United Ireland uh, financially. I, I certainly can't see an independent Northern Ireland uh, in any shape, form, or fashion. Michael, I, got, I think most people actually one thing we agree on is that it would be a non-starter. And I would allude to maybe that there's a lot of uh, cultural things come from a PUL community has an All-Ireland business, like the Orange Order is an All-Ireland business. When, when you say PUL, just for our viewers... Loyalist, it's a term for okay. people from the Unionist Loyalist. But a lot of their, their uh, cultural things has an All-Ireland business, like the Orange Order is an All-Ireland Bobby Brian was saying about the cricket and uh, rugby and hockey and things that are traditionally Unionist sports would be All-Ireland in nature. And even the Protestant churches, Methodist Presbyterian and the Church of Ireland are all Ireland. So an independent Northern Ireland is, is never going to, the Northern state can't succeed. It's, it's there artificially, it's there unnaturally, it's there as, as a sectarian head point. And it, but you would have your rugby team and you'd, you'd have your, your football team, I suppose, if, if nothing else. Um, okay, lads, we're just, and I don't mean to be flippant when I say that, uh, just something came to my mind. Um we're going to finish up now. We're way over time in reality, but we're going to play the entire interview this evening at nine o'clock anyway. I'd really like to thank all of you for joining us this morning on the show. Is there anything that any of you would like to close with? Any closing statements? Anything you'd like to add before we finish up? No, I'd just like to thank, thank you, Fumbar, for affording us the opportunity. Uh, you know, <clears throat> Absolutely no harm done here. You know, we we we're on here. We're pitching our arguments. We're say, you know, we're selling our position. And I think that this is grassroots grassroots discussions. And we, we whilst we may not agree on everything, but at least to me, I see it as progressive and having these debates and discussions. And and they definitely, you know, should be continuing right throughout the you know the island and islands or whatever. 
uh, you know, at, at, at this level, because it's at this level where we will make the change. If we really leave it to the politicians and the mandarins, it's not going to happen. Any lads want to add anything to that? Well, I, 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 I agree with that. I think, the, you know, for ourselves, it's important that uh, that our message is, is, is heard uh, in the 26 counties, um, you know, and all the concerns are, are, are listened to. I think, as been alluded to early on, uh, I don't think anyone will vote again, uh, you know, for slogans on a bus. So, therefore, all these arguments and all these discussions will need to take place, uh, and that's... Uh, a big thing that the pro-union community will now take on. Okay, gentlemen, we're going to have to finish off. I hope to have you all back on again and maybe have further discussions. And I just... And I just want to thank you because I know if this was Sinn Féin, if this was the DUP, SDLP, we'd be beating around the bush but not talking about anything. And they'd be getting well paid for it. You guys are not getting paid for this. It's your passion that has you here. Guys, we'll talk to you maybe in a month or two again on the show. Thanks for joining us this morning. Okay. Okay. Thank you.